Uh, sorry for the little delay there. Um, but we can jump right in. So this, uh, I'm sure you're all uh, tired of hearing my voice. So lucky for you, this will be the last of the case studies that I present today. And then we'll have one from Michael on um, some even more advanced symmetry and non-point group symmetry stuff, as well as some particle subtraction. Um, so to kind of lay the foundation for that and to kind of get at some questions we had in that first session, um, we're going to be talking about, oh, is it possible to hide that thing at the top? Do we know? Oh, layout, maybe? Yeah. Sweet. All right. Um, so we'll be talking about trip V5, which is a related channel, and pseudosymmetry. Um, <clears throat> kind of throughout this whole case study, I want you to be thinking about, and we've kind of already talked about this a bit, is any real thing truly symmetric? Like, is this something that is actually physically ever going to happen? And do we care, right? Do we care that something isn't truly symmetric or is just symmetric except for this one angstrom shift, right? These are kind of the like kind of larger concepts that I'm kind of thinking about during this case study. So we're going to be talking about trip V5, which is um, related to trip V1, the ion channel we were talking about before lunch. Um, it is also a homo tetramer, um, but it is more specific for calcium currents. Uh, so specifically, the calcium ion is more likely to go through this ion channel than other um, cations. Uh, so the original authors of this study, uh, which is Empire 10256, um, were really interested in the source of this calcium specificity, right? Why does this ion channel pass more calcium current than other kinds? And so they collected this data with a high amount of calcium present in their sample. Okay. So uh, the reason that I spent so long talking about that standard workflow in the last case study is that because I basically do those jobs every single time I process cryo-EM data, if we did, if I walked you through that every time, this would be a really boring two days because we'd have an hour and a half to talk about the same jobs every time. So I'm going to skip all of that. I impose C4 symmetry and we do that whole process. Motion correction, CTF estimation, blob picking, 2D classification, templates, template picking, blah, blah, blah. We get to our consensus refinement. Okay, this is what it looks like. We can take a look in Chimera X um, and see, oh, look at that. It's a really nice little map. Our C terminal domain for this ion channel happens to look a little bit better, I think, than the trip V1 ion channel. Um, the helices look good. Uh, if we look at the handedness, right, it's maybe a little bit hard to tell here but we've got the right-handedness, so that's good, right? If you put your hand on there and follow it up, it's your right hand. Um, but something to call your attention to is this weird floating blob in the middle of the C-terminal domain. Um, what is that, right? That's, it's, it's strange if you think about the fact that this, is, this isn't one particle, right? There's hundreds of thousands of particles. So what is this thing that's floating in this ion channel? If we contour down, you might get more and more alarmed as it turns into this weird fourfold symmetric thing, right? What is this? Okay. Um, I'm here asking the same question with images, but the answer is this is calmodulin. Okay, calmodulin is a pretty ubiquitous protein that is used in all kinds of different systems to help proteins respond to calcium concentrations. And we know that this channel you know, is uh, responsive to calcium, and so it also does bind calmodulin. Okay, and the authors included calmodulin in the sample. The problem is, if you dock calmodulin into this map, it's really only as big as one of those four positions. Okay? Biochemistry tells us, like other experiments that are not cryo-EM, right? things like uh, chromatography, you know, maybe they did some mass spec, I don't actually know. But we know from biochemistry that there's only one calmodulin, almost exactly, per ion channel. A very small number have two, but almost all ion channels have one calmodulin. Okay, so we're seeing something kind of weird here. We have four times too much calmodulin, right? Every ion channel should have one, but we're seeing density that's kind of there for four. The other sort of weird thing that we're seeing here is that the calmodulin is much, much weaker than the surrounding map, right? If you remember, when I looked at the map and we were looking at that contour that looked really good, there was, you could only see that one little blob in the middle. And then as I contoured way, way down, and we were looking at the very, very weakest parts of the map, that is when this fourfold calmodulin appeared, right? So we expect from biochemistry that there should only be one calmodulin bound to trip B5. Why do we see four? And why do they have a lower strength than the surrounding channel? And based on your guys' questions, 
sounds like you might already have a handle on this. So if I hear, you know, if you feel like you're done, feel free to just stop talking. I don't know. But just to get us back into the flow of things after lunch, I'm going to give you a minute to figure out why we're seeing four calmodulants here and um, why they have a lower strength. All right. So one minute to think to yourself and then four minutes to discuss with the neighbor after. Okay, so go ahead and discuss with your neighbor for four minutes or less why you think we're seeing four times too many, why they're weaker. All right, I think even though there's some more time on the clock still, it looks like a lot of people are winding down. So I'm just going to bring us back. I heard a lot of conversation about symmetry, which is, I think, kind of what my answer would be here, right? If we know from biochemistry that each particle only has a single calmodulin, but we're enforcing symmetry, right? We're saying every particle must be averaged together in all four symmetry-related positions, then the ion channel, right, the surrounding part that is C4 symmetric, is reinforced, right? Each of those four different positions, there's the same signal in the same place. So it stays strong, but the calmodulin in each of those four positions, it only has calmodulin there once. So because you're kind of averaging together everything four times, it's a quarter as strong, right? Because only one of those four orientations has the calmodulin there, okay? So this is a pretty classic example of enforcing um, symmetry before you really ought to. Because in this case, even though the ion channel is C4 symmetric, the particles have this calmodulin that breaks that symmetry. Okay, so you'll most often hear this referred to as pseudosymmetry, which is not to say like it looks like it's symmetric, but it isn't, it, which does sometimes happen, right? You might have a, something that looks threefold symmetric and just isn't, but there's also cases like this where part of the channel is symmetric, but there's some feature that breaks that symmetry. Okay? All those things would be called pseudosymmetry. Um, there's... A phrase I'm going to be using a lot, and that's symmetry-related position or symmetry-related pose. And 
Um, that's just a way of talking about the fact that if you have a symmetric object, right? If I point to any place on this object, there are n minus one other places that are equivalent, right? So in this case, we have this ball moving around on the C terminal, um, uh, CTD of this protein. And uh, the other three balls are in the symmetry related position, right? If you rotate it at 90 degrees, if this ion channel were truly symmetric, those would be kind of identical. So we call those symmetry related poses or symmetry related positions. Okay? It's just a useful way to talk about the fact that the Cal modulo is only in one of these three, uh, four symmetry related positions or poses. Okay? So how are we going to solve this problem? Right? We know now that our map should probably be C1. And this is related to a question we got earlier of kind of now we're stuck, right? Because we have the C4 symmetric map that we're going to be aligning our particles to. But we think now probably the, the protein is actually C1 symmetric. Um, so you could go back to the beginning uh, and start over again. But in, in, in this case, that might work. The Calmodulin is such a big domain that it might work to just start from C1, basically over from your particles. But I want to use this as an example for what if that doesn't work, right? Because it's nice that we have this big domain. It's really obvious whether something works or doesn't. And I'm going to talk about techniques you can use for samples that are a little bit more challenging, where maybe you can't just start from C1 from the beginning. And then, um, uh, again, the next case study we do that Michael presents will have go into even more detail about other kinds of symmetry. Okay? So one thing you might try is just, well, we have the C4 symmetric map. Let's just do a non-uniform refinement with C1, right? So we stop imposing symmetry, but we don't change anything about the map. We don't do anything. Let's just see what happens. Okay? So we'll take the particles and the volume from that C4 symmetric map that I just showed you that we got from doing our standard workflow but then leave all the other parameters, all the parameters default. So that's C1 symmetry, right? Um, here's the result. So it's better, right? Now, instead of four equally strong um, calmodulins, we kind of have two that are equally strong and two that are kind of half strong, okay? This happens because as we were aligning these particles, we are no longer forcing them to go into all four symmetry-related poses. We're only using them in the pose they match best. To start with, the map is identical. They're picking one of those poses at random. But because it's no longer forced to be symmetric, those particles, let's just say by sheer random chance, the position on the left-hand side happens to get more calmodulins. Now the map will be a little bit stronger there. So now maybe more particles align with their calmodulin there. And then next iteration, that's even more of an effect, right? And more and more and more. However, there's no guarantee that this will ever get you to the right answer, right? You're just hoping that the accumulation of noise will pull you there, OK? Um, I'm actually going to skip this one because I just answered it accidentally. So if we give it more iterations, right? I told you that we stop a refinement when the map stops changing. That is not entirely true. We stop a refinement when the GSFSC stops changing. That doesn't necessarily mean that the map has stopped changing. It just means that our sort of that Fourier shell resolution has stopped improving. Okay. It might be that the parks are still moving between these symmetry related poses quite a bit. So if we force the refinement to take more iterations, right? If we say, once you think you're done, do 20 more iterations, this effect of noise accumulating and slowly particles being pulled into one pose or the other will continue to happen, even though the GSFSC resolution is stuck, in this case, I think, around three. Um, so we can see this result, where I added a bunch more final iterations at the end, looks even better than the one I just showed you. However, it took six times longer, because those final iterations use all the particles and the full resolution of the map, so it's very slow. And it still didn't work. Right? So this is obviously not the best option. What we have is this situation, where our particles are kind of aligned in this random orientation, and we need to break them apart and fix them. So we could try and do literally that, right? We have we just spent uh, all the time before lunch talking about classification techniques. Maybe we can classify these particles into the four symmetry-related positions, right? We can put all the ones that have top left in one class, all the ones that have top right in another class, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Then. We can independently rotate all of those classes and the particles in them, right? That's the key, so that they're all in the same registration, and then put them back together and uh, refine them, having done this kind of classification and then declassification, right? So let's try that, right? One of the techniques we talked about is heterogeneous refinement. 
And the reason we might pick heterogeneous refinement in this case is that we know that the particles poses are okay, but this calmodulin might have pulled some of their poses out of order. So we wanna refine those poses a little bit and we wanna split them into classes, all right? So for the inputs, I'm gonna give four copies of the symmetric volume from non-uniform refinement. And remember that if you give identical volumes, CryoSpark will force particles to randomly associate or else they would all just go to one of them, right? But CryoSpark in the early iterations will force identical volumes to share particles. So we'll give four copies. We'll just hope that noise pulls apart these orientations. Um, we will force hard classification because these volumes are gonna mostly look basically the same, right? The ion channel is symmetric, so it'll be the same in all of the classes. It's just that calmodulin is changing. And the initial resolution, I'm gonna bring a little a lower value, a higher resolution, just to be sure we get a little bit of separation of the calmodulin from that ion channel, okay? So what's happening in this job? The particles are being aligned to each of the four input volumes. And in the beginning, they're identical, so they're being split evenly, but as things change, right, as the one of the calmodulins gets stronger and the rest get weaker, the particles will be pushed over there. The particles are assigned to whichever class they fit best, and the volumes change when the particles cl uh, closes or class membership changes. So now this one, I am gonna have the answer. Do you think that this job will successfully separate the four symmetry related maps? Why or why not? You got a minute and then four minutes. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and discuss with your neighbor whether you think this will work or not.
Okay. So we run this heterogeneous refinement with four classes. And the input maps are four copies of the same C4 symmetric map. Right? So here's the results. Um, again, I think it's a slight improvement over the quality of that non-uniform refinement. And it's much faster than the one we ran where we gave it 20 extra iterations at the end. Right? It still hasn't separated out what we're looking for. And I think there's a few reasons for this. One is that we didn't really provide any indication of what we were looking for, right? And that's personifying the algorithm a bit. But you know, we didn't say this one should have a Cal module in here, this one there, this one there, this one there. We just gave it four and said, find the difference. And so some of these, it's only got two. Some it's got two in a different position. The one on the top right, it's mostly only got one. So you know, there is, in some sense, it's working that way. The other problem here is that home, or heterogeneous refinement is doing pose alignment, OK? So there's a lot of degrees of freedom in this job, right? All of the particles were saying they might be different in terms of which class they're in, or they might just be poorly aligned. So maybe it just changes the alignment a little bit. Maybe it moves around the class, right? And because it has to check all those poses every single iteration, it's slower than if we weren't checking poses, OK? So there's too many degrees of, heter of freedom in heterogeneous refinement. That's why we have a different job type called 3D classification, OK? In other um, packages, it might be called uh, classification without alignment. Because the principle is that um, similar to heterogeneous refinement, we are taking some number of classes, and we're splitting particles into which class they belong based on how well their pose matches that class's volume, that reference, right? The difference is, uh, oh, sorry. And uh, another nice thing about 3D classification is that we don't provide input volumes. There are a couple different ways. You can provide input volumes, but there's also a couple different ways you can generate starting volume directly from the data. So we no longer need to give that C4 symmetric volume. We can generate them from the data. And oops, oh no. Oh, what did I do? Uh, it's fine. Let me just really quickly sneak preview. OK. Um, the nice thing that's different about 3D classification is that the poses are locked. Okay? Every iteration, we are using the exact same poses from the input consensus refinement and just splitting them up into classes depending on which class they match best. Okay? And that's another reason that consensus refinement is really useful because we know the ion channel looks really good. That means our poses are probably pretty high quality for the overall um, target. The problem is this Cal modulant. We've sort of blurred this 90 degree rotation. And so um, that's why our maps are looking bad. But the poses are probably mostly right. They're just off by 90, 180, or 270 degrees. OK? So we're going to create a 3D classification job. This is the first of these we've run. The inputs are the C4 symmetric or, uh, particles from non uniform refinement. We are not giving input volumes here. OK? So we're just taking the particles with their poses that are off by some multiple of 90 degrees, right? Um, we're providing a mask. In this case, we're just using a solvent mask. There's actually two kinds of mask that 3D classification can accept. Um, we'll talk more about those tomorrow. A solvent mask should go around everything that isn't just totally empty solvent. So in our case, this is what our solvent mask will look like. Um, you can see the channel in the middle there. And then I also have it going around the micelle. That's why it bulges out um, by the TMD. So we're basically, this mask surrounds everything that isn't zero, OK? Um, we're going to use an initialization mode of PCA, principal component analysis. So the initialization mode is what I was talking about, where you can generate the volumes directly from the data, like how you can with ab initio. The difference is ab initio, you don't know the poses, right? So you're just sort of trying to quickly get to this volume. For 3D classification, you know your poses are pretty good. So what you can do is either randomly pick particles and say, these 1,000 particles are input volume one. These are input volume two. That's called the simple mode, where you just randomly take particles and uh, group them into the classes. PCA is kind of a step past that, where you actually do many, many, many random groups of particles produce a wide range of volumes. And then you look at the differences between those volumes using principal component analysis and try to find kind of clusters of volumes that are similar. So in this case, we'll do probably 100. I don't actually know how many exactly it does, but many, many reconstructions. And then we'll find four clusters of volumes that are most similar to each other and kind of take the average volume of those clusters to start. 
So it's a way of preventing this problem where we have four identical volumes that we're trying to split the particles between. Now they will be different. And using PCA, they'll kind of be more different than uh, uh, you might get with me. Um, again, I'm forcing hard classification to be true because we expect these channels to be mostly the same. Um, filter resolution is an extremely, extremely important parameter. Um, when you hear resolution, if you're anything like me, you're like lower number, lower number, right? I want it to be two. That's the resolution of your map. Filter resolution is kind of telling you what kind of, um, how big is the difference I'm looking for, okay? So to give you an example, uh, if I showed you these two signals, um, if you're like me, you'd say those are different, right? They have some shift to them, so those are different signals. I'd say these are the same because they overlap, right? The blue and red are overlapping. This, I don't know, right? In some sense, they look the same to me, right? The high frequency part is overlapping, but there's clearly a low frequency part that's shifted, okay? So whether or not these signals are the same or different depends on what resolution you're talking about. That is what filter resolution controls. If we set a low filter resolution, we'll say these are different because they have that phase shift in the low frequencies. If we set a high filter resolution, we'll say these are the same because the high frequencies look similar and the overall wave is very similar, right? So this is what we're controlling with that filter resolution. Generally, you wanna set the filter resolution to the lowest resolution, the highest number, um, such that you can still see the difference, right? So if you set it to like 60 angstroms, it's just a sphere. That's way too low, uh, too low resolution. If you set it um, to, you know, you want to find that resolution where you can still see the calmodulin, but it's not like super high resolution, okay? Um, so I'm setting it to four in this case. And then the initial low, low pass is just when we create those PCA volumes, how much do we low pass them before doing the classification? I generally will set this to a little bit lower resolution than my filter resolution, um, but you can go up to the filter resolution. It doesn't hurt too bad, okay? So what's happening in this job, this is a new job type, 3D classification. The particles poses are not changing, okay? So previously, at the end of our standard workflow, we did that consensus refinement, that non-uniform refinement. We found the optimal pose. We are keeping those poses. So those poses are probably wrong by some multiple of 90 degrees around the z-axis, right? However, we have four classes. And each iteration, the particles go to the class they match the best, all right? And the volumes only change when their particle composition changes. Here's the result. Bad, right? Why do we have three spheres and then one C4 symmetric particle. The reason is we started, here's our PCA volumes, right? And you can see there is some difference, right? The one on the top right, the noise in the middle where the calmodulin is different from the blue, right? This is what PCA did. These are our starting volumes. They're a little bit different from each other. However, as the iterations proceed, all the particles start to look more and more like that bottom right class. And then that map is better. So more particles look like that than the other ones. And then finally, they all collapse. And we end up with, I think, in the other three classes, there's like 20 particles. And all, however many, 100,000 are in that one class. Okay. The reason for this is because we self set that filter resolution to four angstroms. And at four angstroms, we're looking at things like, how is this alpha helix looking, right? These beta sheets, like, what are they doing? Right? That's not really what we're looking at. We're looking at this huge object. It's called modulin. And so we sort of lose the forest for the trees here. If I turn off for forced hard classification, so if I let the particles kind of blur themselves out among the classes based on how well they match that class, this problem goes away. Because the problem in the last, uh, the last job was that if a particle said, I look just 0.0001% more like class D than class A, 100% of it would go to class D. So if we turn off that forced hard classification, we lose the problem of the collapse where all the particles go to a single class, but we also, it doesn't do anything, right? Now we just have four C4 symmetric maps because all the particles have split themselves approximately equally among the four classes. So this is what filter resolution is for, right? If I increase the filter resolution to six, and now we have hard classification on again, you can see that we lost that collapse problem and the result uh, is much better, right? The class in the top left almost only has one calmodulin, right? And these other ones only have two instead of three or four. The benefit here is that this job took five minutes, 
okay? These jobs are so fast because you don't have to do any pose alignments. You're just comparing the volume to the particle image over and over again, so, so fast, okay? If we increase the filter resolution to 10, it just works, right? Again, five minutes, and it is able to split these things apart because we tuned that filter resolution. At 10 angstroms, you can still see the calmodulin, but the ion channel has kind of been blurred out. And so the only thing that will change how well a particle matches a class is where that calmodulin is. Okay, so that's the power of filter resolution. Just by changing that one parameter, we get totally different results. And then of course you can go too far in the other direction. At 16 angstroms, our maps start to look like this, where now we have lost, we've blurred everything out so much that it's hard to tell where the calmodulin even is. And this gets even worse at 20 angstroms, where we're just sort of blurring things out, okay? So there's a happy medium. You want that filter resolution to be as blurry as it can be where you can still see what you're looking for, okay? So we've got this nice 10 angstrom result in the top. And I'm just, again, emphasizing that all we're changing here is the filter resolution, and you get these really dramatic effects. So if you're ever running one of these jobs and you get this problem where all your particles go to one class or you're not getting a nice separation, like you know there should be two classes, but you're only seeing really one or the same thing twice, the filter resolution is the first thing I would recommend playing. Okay. So we have this 10 angstrom result. What can we do with it, right? Now we have these four classes and the calmodulin is only, well, the orange one, there's a little bit of two, but that's okay. Some of these channels do have two calmodulin. Um, so now we have these four different maps, but we want one good map with the calmodulin in the right place, right? It doesn't do as much good to have four different classes each of which has a calmodulin in a different place. Um, this is what a great job called Align 3D Maps is for. Okay, so the problem we've been struggling with is remember that our particle images are horrible, right? Telling where a calmodulin is in an individual particle image is really, really hard. Telling where a calmodulin is in a map is really easy. You can just look at it and point, right? What Align 3D Maps does is it lets us say, okay, these particles all belong to this map and we know they have some pose. If we take this whole map and rotate it by 90 degrees, we can rotate all of those particles by 90 degrees as well without having to do the alignment of the particles to the volume because we know that the particles here are aligned to the volume here. So when we rotate this volume, we rotate all those particles, okay? So we can do that with this um, job. We're gonna plug in. So for this job, you need a reference volume. That's the volume we're trying to align everything to. And then you need any number of input volumes and their particles, okay? Um, you can provide the reference volume as an input volume, and that just makes things easier down the road. So you don't need to remember to go get the reference volume. So we'll just pick one of the four volumes at random. It doesn't matter because we know these are all the same particle, right? And then um, we'll use the solvent mask from classification just to ignore some noise that might be out of the periphery. We'll plug in all the volumes from the 10 angstrom classification, again, just so that it's all in one group. And we'll have update particle alignments true. And that's what lets you, if you have that off, there's no particle inputs, you're just lining up the volumes. We want that on so that we update the particles poses to match where their volumes end up as well. Okay, so what's happening in this job is we have volumes and they're in one of four symmetry related positions, A, B, C, or D. Okay, We are gonna rotate and translate those volumes so that the volumes match the reference volume. We're not thinking about particle images at all. Then, once we have found those rotations necessary, they're probably just going to be 90 degrees multiple around Z, we'll apply that same rotation to all the particles' poses, okay? And then, this job is super, super fast because we're just comparing four volumes to each other, right? Or really, we're comparing four volumes to one. So the volume comparison is very fast, and then the particles we get for free, okay? So here's the result of that. I took those four classes, and we lined them all up. So now, the calmodulin's in the same place. And these are a little bit lower resolution because of the resolution that's used to align them. And I, I didn't reconstruct them here. I apologize for that. But basically you can see now our calmodulin's in the same position in all four maps. And since we know what the particle's pose is for those maps, we were able to update the particle's poses as well. So now we have all the particle's poses in this orientation as well. So all we have to do left is build a local refinement. I will turn on basically the same settings I used for the previous local refinements where we're using this Gaussian because I think small shifts are more likely than big shifts. And then look at that. It's a beautiful map with only a single calmodulin in it. We have that nice high resolution and we've lost those three ghost calmodulins. 
All told, this took three jobs and 20 minutes if I had picked the right filter resolution from the start, which is easier than you might think to do. You just can look at your map and filter it until you see the Cal module and start to blur into the ion channel. Okay. I had to run a 3D classification. I had to run a line 3D maps. And then I had to run a local refinement. Oh, I used to have a question here. Hmm. Oh, well. So the reason it's important that I picked a local refinement instead of a homogeneous refinement is because homogeneous refinements are global, right? Remember that when you run a homogeneous or non-uniform refinement, you're always checking every pose. For something like this, that might be OK now that that commodulin is really strong. But whenever you have a pseudo-symmetric feature, if you ever successfully break that pseudo-symmetry, if you ever successfully pull that commodulin out, you probably don't want to go back to a global refinement because global is going to check all those poses and it might scramble up your rotations again. You always want to stick with a local refinement because you know you never want to rotate it more than 90 degrees because then you're in trouble. Right? Okay. Um, however, I never took advantage really of the fact that we know these particles are C4 pseudosymmetric. Right? I did take advantage of that fact in that I picked four 3D classes. Right? I knew that I only wanted four classes. But I never, like each particle we know is C4 pseudosymmetric. And so maybe we can take better advantage of that fact in a different job. For instance, we could try symmetry expansion. Okay? If you remember from the uh, like kind of first part, the fundamentals part, symmetry expansion. Oh, uh, this is wrong. <laughs> this is symmetry relaxation. Mm -hmm. uh, symmetry relaxation, imagine it says symmetry relaxation up there, is when we align the particles once and then check the symmetry related positions, right? So we treat them as C1 symmetric, but we know we should check the symmetry related poses, okay? So we're gonna plug in to a non-uniform refinement. This is a global refinement again. We're gonna plug in the particles and volume from that consensus non-uniform refinement, the one that has the four Cal modulins. We're gonna set the symmetry to C4. Uh, we're gonna leave minimized per particle scale to true, but we're setting the maximum alignment resolution to 10. We're using that kind of like a filter resolution here, right? We want this algorithm to prioritize where that calmodulin ends up. We don't really care about the alpha helices. And then the important thing is we set symmetry relaxation method to maximization. Okay, there's three options in this dropdown. One is none, which just does imposed symmetry. It forces the map to be C4. One, this one is maximization, which is where you have your particle, you align it to the map, and then you check the four symmetry related positions. And then whichever of those, when you check those four symmetry related positions, you actually check a small neighborhood. So you rotate the particle 90 degrees and then you turn it around a little bit to find the best pose. Rotate 90 degrees, turn it around a little bit to find the best pose. Maximization is you just use the very, very best pose you found in all of those neighborhoods. There's another one, marginalization, which um, you kind of, find the best of those four symmetry related poses and then blur it out over the quality of the poses in that neighborhood. Okay, so we're using maximization here just because we want things to be uh, uh, kind of faster, but um, marginalization can be better in some cases. And then finally, we're setting a number of extra final passes to 20 again. And this is for the same reason as that first non-uniform refinement where if we stop the refinement when it has converged, when the GSFSC has stopped improving, we may not have finished breaking the pseudosymmetry, right? So um, there's kind of two things happening, but we can only really track the resolution. So we're gonna give a bunch of extra final passes um, just to be sure we have finished breaking pseudosymmetry. So in this job, we are aligning input volume. Once the best is found, we're also checking the three symmetry related poses. The best of those poses and only the best of those poses is used in the next iteration's volume. So the difference here is if we were enforcing symmetry, we'd use all four of the symmetry related poses. With symmetry relaxation, we are using only the best one. Here's the result. Um, it's a little bit blurry because remember I set the maximum resolution to 10 angstroms um, to focus on the calmodulin. So afterwards we can do a local refinement um, just to sharpen it up a little bit. And you can see this work just as well, okay? Um, the calmodulin has been pulled out nicely. We can see good uh, quality information about the CTD and the Calmodulin. Okay, this is a different workflow, but it's doing kind of a similar thing. It's taking advantage of the fact that this particle is mostly properly aligned, and we just need to find which of those four positions we need to to use. Um, so.
So that, that took advantage of our underlying knowledge of the symmetry. So here's the three techniques that I showed to, to solve this problem. Um, we imposed C4 symmetry. That's what caused the problem in the first place, right? We had this floating little blob in the middle, um, which uh, uh, is not real. Okay? We could use 3D classification to separate all these particles into class A, B, C, or D, depending on where the calmodulin is, rotate the volumes to match each other and bring the particles with them, group them back together and refine them. Or we can use symmetry relaxation followed by local refinement to kind of take advantage of the fact that we know the symmetry, one of those symmetry related poses is the right one, right? The classification doesn't know we're doing anything with symmetry. It might have pulled out, if there was junk in this particle stack, one of those classes might've been junk, right? Symmetry relaxation says, all we're trying to do here is figure out symmetry. So that's the difference. If you have a nice big feature like this, 3D classification can work well because that'll probably be the biggest difference in the particle. If there might be junk or if there might be something binding or unbinding in addition to the pseudo symmetry, symmetry relaxation might work better, okay? The other difference is time. It takes 25 minutes to get the wrong answer, which is not particularly helpful. It took 68 minutes to get, including the initial classification. So all of these kind of have the same first 25 minutes in them. It took 68 minutes to get the, um, the, the 3D classification aligned and local refinement. Most of that, 30 some minutes of that was, so 30 some minutes was this initial refinement or 25 minutes was the initial one, 30 some minutes was the local refinement. So basically all of that is spent doing the refinements on either side. Um, the symmetry relaxation took um, 40, and most of that was those final iterations. And actually I looked at this job, 20 was way too many. It was actually done after around six. So um, if you're really constrained by time, you can, you can try using fewer. I recommend just set a bunch of extra and you know, go home um, because it'll run overnight and then you'll be sure that you ended up at the right place. Let's talk about trip V1. Oh, actually, let's do questions first. That was a lot of stuff. Oh, and now my question thing isn't working. Oh, well. Do we have questions? Uh, hi, regarding the, the symmetry relaxation, uh, if you, your input model is the C4 enforced model. Yes. Is there any chance um, they couldn't distinguish all four poses and still give you the, the same map? Yes. So uh, probably in the first iteration, that's what happens, right? Because in the first iteration, it has that symmetric map that we forced to be symmetric. And so it can't, there's no difference between the four. However, once you've done that first iteration, there is some, some asymmetry, right? Just by random chance, you'll end up with more one or the other place. However, that's where earlier Michael was mentioning the job, the heterogeneous or the homogeneous reconstruction only job, which um, we've already done once to flip the hand of the particles. That same job has an option you can turn on that before you run these symmetry relaxation jobs, you randomly put those particles in one of the four or one of the N symmetry related positions. And so that sort of adds a bunch of that asymmetric signal to the map to start with. So if you're worried about the symmetry breaking or if it's not working, that's another thing you can try that helps helps the results. But let's say if it's a higher order symmetry, there are still chances that you end up with two copy of commodity in your yeah. final map. You don't have enough perturbation here. Definitely. There's definitely still a chance. And if that happens, um, there's a few things you can do. One is, of course, you could try the classification approach. Like I said, there's, there's many ways to approach all these problems. Um, another thing you that you could try is erasing manually some of the calmodulants. Whenever you get into the question of manually manipulating a map and then aligning to something that you didn't get directly from your data, I personally get a little squeamish because of the, the template bias problem, right? If you're erasing by yourself, you know you have no guarantee anymore that that came from your data. Um, in this case, it's such a big domain that you're erasing, it'd be surprising if, you were able to align all the particles such that that domain disappeared. But if it was something smaller, I'd be a little worried about manually doing it. Hi, I have a question. So when you initially saw the four ghostly copies of yeah. Calmodulin in your C4 map, uh, why wouldn't one just go back and re-refine just with C1 yeah. and see if you can accomplish uh, what you just you just did with the other two workflows that you described. 
Yeah, so that's a good question. I think in this case, and actually I know in this case because I tried it, um, ab initio can do this, no problem. It'll get you the right answer to start with. Um, this example is just so that there's something big we can all see. Um, if you have a much smaller thing, like for instance, maybe one of these four subunits is actually a different isomer and it has a, you know, it has this extra loop or something. That is the kind of thing that's much harder to pull out just by refining in C1 because it'll probably just get blurred out into the noise. So that's where these techniques are a little more applicable. Awesome. Thank you. Uh my question is regarding symmetry relaxation. Hmm. So there are two options here, maximization and marginalization. Hmm. When, when do you use one of those and how do you pick which one is correct for your problem here? Yeah, What's I the mean, difference? I'm going to let Michael take this one, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the two modes are um, kind of complementary to how we do um, back projection in CryoSpark in general. Um, so uh, the homogeneous refinement job that Rich displayed earlier today, um, that job just uses maximization. So what it does is, and this is totally um, aside from the question of symmetry, um, each particle is given a pose and then we back project it with just that pose. There is no sort of smearing along different orientations. Um, what we found is that, and what rely on other softwares do um, often um, is, um, especially with smaller particles or worse signal to noise ratio, um, if you smear particles a bit over the orientation um, and you look at each orientation, you figure out what the probability of the particle being from the orientation is, um, and then you back project with that orientation, um, it helps prevent overfitting a little bit and it helps the algorithms be just a little bit more stable. Um, and so in non-uniform refinement, since this job is usually used for um, proteins that are um, smaller and maybe have a lot more disorder in them, uh, we by default, turn the marginalization mode on. And so um, the way that it kind of extends to symmetry relaxation is our suggestions are um, pretty much the same as what, whether you'd want to turn that on in just any normal case. So for small proteins, for proteins with a lot of disorder, um, for proteins with large micelles or nano disks, um, or for when your data, maybe you're not confident in the signal noise ratio and it's kind of low, um, we typically observe that marginalization is a bit more stable. Um, and we suggest turning that on both um, as an alignment feature and for the symmetry relaxation mode. Um, that being said, we've actually had reports on the forum where it was kind of contrary to that. Um, so it's very hard to characterize in general. Um, but yeah, and, and since you know you can always run two jobs in parallel and have them both going, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so the the normal process for these sorts of things, it, whether or not you can see that it's uh, symmetric or not, would be to start your um, you start your your um, image processing in C one, and if the object really did have C four symmetry, uh, that C one reconstruction would have the fourfold axis in a random orientation. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. just going to be. Mm -hmm random then eventually to do any symmetry relaxation you have to know that your symmetry axis is along z yeah so somehow getting from c1 to a c4 which you can apply symmetry relaxation to you have to first discover that it's c4 and then bring the c4 axis to the z axis uh how's that done so yeah that's, that's a really important point that i forgot to highlight which is when we do these symmetry relaxation things we're not looking at the map Right? The, the algorithm doesn't look at the map and say, there's the symmetry. It is always going to do around, for, for C symmetries, it'll always do around the Z axis. Right? So it's important, like you're saying, to have that symmetry axis aligned to the Z for, for C symmetries. We have a job, um, volume alignment tools, I think, as a parameter. Is it volume alignment tools? You know. Um, yeah, so the volume alignment tools job has a sort of baked in symmetry uh, alignment um, sub process. Um, so in cases where you're starting from like C4 all the way from the beginning and you've done ab initio, then you don't need to worry about this because your volume already has it. Um, but in cases where you're going from C1 to anything that's not C1, this is where you have to pay a little bit more attention. Um, this symmetry alignment um, subprocess is built into homogeneous refinement and non uniform refinement. So if you enter in in the force symmetry, it will already do this. Um, where it's not built in is the symmetry relaxation point. Um, so if you're going to use symmetry relaxation, you do need to create a volume alignment tools job, and then you can turn on symmetry alignment in that job, and then put in the symmetry group that you think that your molecule has. Um, as for the question of 
figuring out which symmetry group your molecule has, um, that's definitely been more tricky. Uh, it's hard to speak on in general. Um, I guess one thing that I can say is um, I know that Chimera does have a, um, a tool to measure the symmetry in a map, but it does this based on just a correlation based thing. Um, I, 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 it's, I, I don't even use it too much, so I can't really speak too much on it, but um, yeah, it is hard to answer that question in general. Um, for these uh, 3D classification job, I just wanted to ask you, do you use the default solvent mask that CryoSpark uh, like makes, or did you actually make it yourself? In this case, uh, I think I made that one myself because um, the one made during the refinement excluded the micelle. Uh, the, whether or not a solvent mask should include the micelle, you know, you can go either way. Um, sometimes, so the micelle is unstructured and extremely noisy, right? So sometimes if you include the micelle in your solvent mask, you'll end up, uh, uh, it, it, it won't work, right? Um, so in this case, I made it myself. Um, in practice, I think it's fine to mostly use CryoSparks, the one that was generated during the refinement. But often your uh, three classification works best if you also use a focus mask, which is the other kind uh, that you can make. And we'll talk about that more in a different case study. And I find that if I'm already making a focus mask anyway, it doesn't take much more effort to really make the solvent mask that I want. So I usually make them by hand um, and it's good to get practice making masks. <laughs> so, yeah. I think um, let's go ahead and uh, do done questions there and we can do more at the end, of course, because there's a little more to talk about here with trip channels and symmetry. Namely, if we go back and look at um, trip B1, remember we have those double knot toxins, DKTX. We have two of them that bind the uh, ion channel. If we look at those toxins, specifically we look at the linkers, they look suspiciously C4 symmetric, right? And in this ion channel, when we were doing all these refinements, we imposed C4 symmetry. But I know that there's two molecules here. So what's happening, right? Why do we have linkers between all four of these knots when I know there's only two molecules, each of which has two knots, okay? The reason is we imposed that symmetry. Right? It's the same problem that we ran into with calmodulin, but in this case, the part that is asymmetric is so much smaller that we didn't notice it at first. Right? We actually have these two confirmations. I'm calling them forward and backward here, but they're not even really confirmations, right? Because this isn't a real physical thing. This is all related to the convention that we chose. Right? We're saying these are in two different, I'm gonna say orientation or try to, because it is just how we've aligned the images. All of these particles, only have linkers either on those pairs of knots or these pairs of knots, because there's two molecules here. So there's only two linkers, okay? So let's work through the same process here, but now we're gonna try and separate out these two different um, orientations of particle, right? So similar to how we had one calmodulin blurred across four positions, here we have two double knot toxins that are blurred out in either the forward or backward orientation. So we covered several methods that we tried to use uh, to resolve the pseudosymmetry in trip V5 with calmodulin. One was um, heterogeneous refinement, where we gave it n different maps and we tried to get it to split up that way. Um, one was the symmetry relaxation, which ended up working really nicely, where uh, we align the particle once and then check those related poses. And then finally, we did uh, 3D classification, where we basically split out the two orientations, which again are not like a real thing in the particle. It's just about how we've aligned the particles and then align those maps to put them back together. Um, heterogeneous refinement didn't work very well, so I'm just gonna skip that one, right? So we're just gonna talk about symmetry relaxation and 3D classification for this target now, okay? So let's try and do the same thing that we did for the trip V5 case, where we'll create a non-uniform refinement and we'll give it the particles and the map from the C4 non-uniform refinement. We're going to select C4 symmetry here. And this might be a little surprising because we know the particles themselves are actually C2 symmetric, right? The channel is C4 symmetric, but the toxins make it C2 because there's that 180 degree rotation. So why don't we say C2 here? The reason is, let's just consider a particle that's in this forward orientation. If we impose C2 symmetry relaxation, what that means is we find the best pose and then we do C2 symmetry, we check 180 degrees. But in this case, that's the same thing because it really is C2 symmetric. We want to check the pose we found and 90 degrees rotated. But the way to do that is to do C4. So we'll end up checking some duplicates, right? We'll check the same position twice, but because we need to check that 
90 degree rotation, we need to use C4 symmetry relaxation here instead of C2. We can come back later, and in that local refinement we do, once we've classified and recombined everything, we can impose C2 symmetry, right? But for the relaxation step, we have to use C4 to find that 90 degree shift, okay? I'm gonna use maximization again. I'm gonna give a ton of extra final passes. The reason being, this linker is very, very small. And so I expect it to be hard to pull it apart, right? It's so small relative to the rest of the ion channel that I wanna give a lot of extra time for the algorithm to figure out that there's only two linkers here, all right? And then finally, uh, an initial low pass resolution of 20 angstroms, which is a bit uh, higher frequency than the default. Um, this did not work at all, okay? So this is the result of this, um, my stuff is broken. Oh. Um, sorry, one moment. Oh, well, I'll just have to take my word for it. Um, so these linkers, this is the result of the symmetry relaxation, right? where we align and then check the 90 degree related poses. They are not identical anymore, okay? You can see this one on the left-hand side is a little bit weaker than the other three. The problem we're running into here is that these linkers are just so small relative to the rest of the channel that no matter what we do, right, there's gonna be some feature, maybe the CTD is flexed in a certain way and it's just so much bigger than these little linkers that there's no way for the asymmetric linkers to pull this channel out of this false symmetry that we found. Okay, so the symmetry relaxation mode didn't work. So that leaves us with 3D classification, which worked in the last case. Let's see about this one. So first we're gonna need to make some masks. And this is where we're gonna talk about focus masks. So the solvent mask, like I said, will include the entire particle and the nanodisc, okay? So the solvent mask is going to surround everything that we think is not empty. So the nanodisc is really there. We want the solvent mask to be around the nanodisc. The channel is really there when the solvent mask be around the channel, okay? The focus mask now is another mask. We're using two masks for this job. The focus mask is just the part that we want to change between our different classes, okay? So here's a little diagram. Outside of the nanodisc and everything, we think that should be flat. We can just set that to zero. And that's what the solvent mask does. Everything outside the solvent mask is zero, okay? Everything inside the solvent mask but outside the focus mask is the consensus refinement. So each class we force to be identical if it's outside the focus mask, but inside the solvent mask. And the reason we do that is that now those particles have no reason to go to one class or another depend based on what's outside the focus mask, because they'll be identical outside the focus mask. Inside the focus mask, the map is created using the particles in that class. Okay, I know it's a lot to think about, a lot of masks, but basically outside the solvent, zero, no signal there. Inside the focus mask is like exactly what you'd expect. It's just the particles in that class make that map. The tricky thing is between the focus and solvent masks, it's the same for all four classes so that the classification will ignore that, right? So for instance, the CTD is this big thing that might change a lot for these particles, but since it's outside the focus mask, it's going to be the same in all four classes. So the particles won't, partition based on the CTD, all right? Here's what my masks look like. There's the ion channel in the middle. We've got the solvent mask is this big pillowy thing around the outside. And the focus mask I've made much smaller and tighter around these linkers and the double knot toxin, right? So the CTD, no classification, just classifying on the double knot toxin. Here's our job. We've got that same set of particles with their poses uh, from the C4 non-uniform refinement. Um, the masks that I talked about, we're asking for two classes, since we know they're either in the forward or backward orientation. Um, we are not imposing any symmetry here. In this 3D classification, you could try imposing C2 symmetry, since you sort of think that the particle really should be C2 symmetric. But at this point, let's just stick with C1 and come back later, right? Filter resolution, just as important here as it was in the trip V5 case. I'm going to use 10 angstroms, but, you know, probably stuff near there would work okay. Um, there's a few more advanced parameters that I've set here for uh, 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 because it's so small. So the OEM batch size, this is getting a little bit into the weeds in terms of the computation. But to speed things up, we don't, in each iteration, use all of the particles. We use a smaller batch. And that's because if the things are really different, using a small batch will get us there faster. 
right? Um, in this case, since the linkers are so small, I wanna use more particles to make sure we have in each batch that we're seeing a good number of both orientations. So that's why I've increased the batch size from 1,000 up to 5,000. The learning rate is at each iteration, I've told you that we average together the particles to make the new maps. That's not quite true. We don't go exactly to the new map from all those particles, because if you happen to get a particularly noisy batch, and then one of your maps turns to total garbage, you'll have that problem where all the particles go to the other map. So instead, we sort of go part of the way between the old map and the new map to kind of slow down the process. But in this case, again, these linkers are so small that if ever one of these iterations is able to have a map that only has two linkers, I wanna go much further in that direction. So I've increased the learning rate here. These are things that you can wait to play with until you really know you need to play with them, but they're nice tools to have in your tool belt. And then of course, forward hard, force hard classification true because we really want there to be this linker or that linker, right? We don't wanna blur between the two. Here are the results. So. On the left-hand side, so these are the two classes, right? We asked for two classes, and we got two classes. The left-hand one, still C4 symmetric, but the one on the right, we did manage to pull out a C2 symmetric map, okay? And this is what I was talking about of, you know, what if you fail to get the, the map you're expecting, right? You're like, I know this should be C2 symmetric, but you just can't get it out. I'm always wary of erasing stuff, right? I could have just gone in, erased two of these linkers and then done a non-uniform refinement and aligned, great. But the problem is I've kind of told it to look for that. But now using this job, this blue map is useless to me. It's still C4 symmetric, but this orange map has told me, yes, there are particles in here that only have two linkers. So now I know we have a reliable source from our data of a two linker map. So now I really trust that it's actually in there and I just need to figure out a way to align all the particles together, right? I can use volume alignment tools to do this. This is like Align 3D uh, maps, where we're gonna change the volume and then bring the particles along. But we, this volume alignment tools is us saying, do this alignment. So in this case, I'm taking the orange class and I'm rotating it 90 degrees. That's just gonna give me the other map, right? So I don't need to get the other map from the classification since I know that there are two linkers in my target. I don't really care that I was only able to pull one of them out with 3D classification. I'll just make the other one. So now I have two maps. I have one for the forward and one for the backward orientation. I plug those into another 3D classification job with all of my particles. So we're back to having them you know, both forward and backward. But now I'm giving them that forward orientation and the backward orientation as an input, okay? So I'm taking the particles from the non-uniform refinement again, all the same settings basically, except initialization mode input, so instead of using PCA and pulling out these volumes directly from the particles themselves, I'm saying, here's the forward map that I got in the previous job, that orange map. And here's when I rotated 90 degrees to get the other orientation. And here's the result, okay? So now that we gave it the two maps to pick between, it's either in the forward orientation or it's in the backward orientation, it was able to pull them apart with the focus mask and with all those tools we've applied. So the last thing to do is do this alignment and then local refinement. Right? For trip V5, we used align 3D maps. So we'll plug in one of those, plug in both of the forward and backward orientation, bingo, bingo, doesn't work. Right? The reason is, again, these linkers are so small that when it aligns these 3D maps, it's just aligning the whole channel and then saying, I'm done. Right? So we need to manually do this again. Luckily, we've done this once, volume alignment tools. Just rotate it. We know it's 90 degrees around Z. Right? We're not blowing any minds here. And then we have rotated all those particles. And finally, finally, we can do our local refinement, okay? So we take our particles from the one of the two classes and the other one that we rotated. So all the particles are in the same orientation. We take the map from the thing we rotated to. Um, we're setting all our usual local refinement settings. And then here I'll impose C2 symmetry, since it really does look like these channels are C2 symmetric with the linkers included. And here's the result, okay? So now you can see our ion channel looks um, great, just like it always did. The C terminus looks maybe a little worse, but that's just the contour. If you change the contour, it looks okay. But now, if you look up at the top there in pink, you can see these um, really gorgeous linkers. I really wish this, let's see. Ooh. Um, you see the linkers are actually C2 symmetric, right? We've lost those two that are bridging in the place they shouldn't be. 
Um, oh, yay. OK, so we see these two linkers here, right? And this is because we did that classification, rotation, local refinement, all right? Now, the reason I really wanted this map to open here is that like, great, this is probably more like what the particles actually look like on the grid, right? We know that those DKTX molecules only have one linker. But if I show you, here's the C4 uh, symmetric map, okay? And we have this problem where we don't see the linkers and that's because they've been averaged out across the two orientations, right? If we contour down, there's our four linkers, right? But let's look, remember that way, way back hours ago, when you weren't tired of me yet, we care about the lipids and the TMD and the NOx, the actual toxin itself, okay? Let's compare that specific thing, the thing with the biology we're actually trying to do, right? So if we look here at the TMD, this is the C4 symmetric map. It looks pretty good, right? There's the NOx, et cetera. If we look at the C2 symmetric map that we went to all this effort to get, it looks basically the same, right? The C2 symmetric map is inarguably closer to what's really on the grid, right? That is the right answer. However, depending on your question, that may not matter to you too much. I'm not telling you it's not worth doing this, right? You don't know whether or not you cannot care about this until you see it. It may be that when you found your C2 symmetric map, there were huge differences that were really important for the biology. You have to know, but now. Sorry to the Zoom people. Hi, uh, I have a here. Uh, I yes. have a more uh, general question. Okay. Uh, when did you embed your data, and do you have to uh, fine tune your pixel size and box size during all those three uh, D processing? That's a really good question. So, um, uh, for this particular data set, uh, I don't exactly remember. But generally, my recommendation is to. Uh, and when you're doing that early classification, pick a very, very like large pixel size, like small image size. Um, I've, I typically will pick something around a two angstrom pixel size um, because you want your images to be pretty small, so it's fast. Once you have a pretty clean particle stack, using those, those um, kind of blurry or like you know, binned, for lack of a better but really Fourier cropped images, um, you can re-extract just the good ones and I usually use a pixel size around one and a half angstroms, so like a Nyquist of three-ish angstroms. Um, and then basically my policy is every time my map gets close to that, you know, I think the conventional wisdom is like two thirds or whatever, but it's like, I look at it and it look, oh, maybe there's a little more. I'll re-extract with a slightly smaller pixel size. And you just kind of keep doing that every time your map so-called hits Nyquist, like hits that maximum resolution, you can just re-extract. So that'll save you some time. It'll prevent you from, 
you know, a lot of the time you collect the Minecrafts in like at 0.8 angstrom pixel size. The odds that you get to 1.6 angstroms, I know I have faith in you. I never get there. So, you know, I, I don't want to waste my time with these huge images when my map's never going to get better than 3.2 anyway. Right. So my policy is wait until I have to. And I think there's something a little bit related is this a uh, a filter power a filter resolution mm -hmm. you use in three D classification it seems a similar concept as the uh, regularization factor in in rely on, uh somehow I guess uh, um it's you can you tune that in in image alignment and because I know that you only use that you said in uh, in three D classification so it is a little different if my, my understanding is that the regularization factor is a little bit different than the, the filter resolution. Um, it, so were you asking about the filter resolution? Yeah, so regularization factor is more like um, how much should we kind of trust our really noisy data? Probably might want to give a more formal definition than that. But basically, the idea is that if you really wanted to, you could say, I only want to use my data. Like, I'm not going to use any of the stuff we know about the protein should be smooth and you know whatever it is. Um, uh, filter resolution is literally just, it actually is very similar to um, pixel size. It's literally doing the same thing. When we talk about a filter resolution, what we're really doing is during the 3D classification, we just make the images smaller. So we'd make your pixel size way bigger. Um, so actually, all those maps I showed you, I ran a different job that remade all those maps at their full resolution. If you download them straight from the 3D classification job, they're actually extremely blurry because they literally are performed at a much larger pixel size, smaller image size. Just a couple of small things to add to that. Um, on the box size, the extraction uh, and downsampling binning question, um, in recent versions, versions of CryoSpark, when you extract particles, there's an option to extract at two different box sizes at the same time, or rather extract and save the particles at the original pixel size and a downsampled pixel size at the same time. That can save you some time if you have the disk space to spare, um, because then you can extract once, run all of your early cleanup steps with the smaller box size, meaning larger pixel size. And then without having to go back and re-extract, you can just now use the full size particles right away. So that's one helpful tip. Um, the other thing was just to add on to this uh, question about regularization. In CryoSpark, we try as much as possible to look for <clears throat> parameterizations of these algorithms where the parameters have some kind of uh, intuitive or interpretable unit or something that helps you to decide how you should set these parameters that modulate the results to a great degree. So this filter resolution is a great example of that. It really makes a huge difference to the results you'll get. And it's a fundamental question. It's not just a sort of implementation question. It's really fundamental about what size of objects are you looking to separate? That's really what this parameter means, right? And so we try to make that into a physical unit in terms of like an actual size, angstroms and angstroms are resolution, so that you can tell CryoSpark, you know, I'm looking for changes at this sort of size scale or this other size scale, et cetera. Um, so that's the reason why it works the way it does. But it really is a fundamental question of what you're trying to ask the classification method to do. So just to add on there. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. Uh, going back to the Calmodulin example, hmm. where you have one Calmodulin, but you spread out these four positions, and you had prior knowledge that there was just one Calmodulin. Uh, but uh, suppose you didn't have that knowledge, you would have uh, the differences in density because, you know, it's a quarter of the thing. So I was wondering if you want to sort of make that as a criterion, but let's take a, a more difficult case. Say, instead of one cal model, and you have three cal modulins occupied in the tetramer. So now you're, you're going to have a small dec uh, decrease in density. So, ha, so my question again, or I'm wondering, how much can you push differences in density uh, without having any prior knowledge of what the stoichiometry is? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think um, <clears throat> to a certain point that, that that's, you know, like I say, it's kind of try it and see, right? If you have something that you're, you, you think is symmetric, especially if it's something like a binding partner, I think it's always worth playing around and seeing, can I find any classes where this binding partner is missing or where it's only in N positions and not these other positions, right? Um, just, to see, just to see if you can find it. Uh, for the reason you're saying that, that you know, even with your prior biochemical knowledge, it turns out that you know, if you look at the maps that I had, um, there was always actually a little bit, so if the calmodulin's here, there's always a little bit of signal down here. 
And it turns out that's really in the data. That's not an alignment problem. Some very small proportion of the channels have a second calmodulin that's kind of halfway bound on this other position. So there is very weak density down there that you can't get rid of because it's really there. Um, I guess these problems of these, these kind of ensemble techniques where at the end of the day, you know, I think it's, it's any time you, you want to make a big conclusion, you kind of need orthogonal, you know, cryo-EM can't be all of it, right? You also want to have some kind of other orthogonal experiment that, that can really, you can be sure. And, and, you know, that's not to say that the maps we make aren't reliable, um, but it's just, it's good to be sure because, you know, especially the case you're talking about, if there's, uh, if you're just going off differences in density, it can be tricky. But I think that's why I would recommend not imposing symmetry to start, just so you can kind of dodge this question from, from the gate. And then also always try to break the symmetry, even if you think it really is symmetric, because if, if it's not and you try, you'll break it. But if you don't try, you won't know. Yeah. Um, and and you, could you go back to the, to the place where you uh, uh, applied the focus mask? Yes. And then, um, Go go to the place where you've ended up having okay. You ended up having the two, the, the two, um, the C two symmetry object. Uh, was your focus mask kind of uh, chosen? The, the, the focus mask had to be chosen only looking at the the blue. You had to yes. choose your focus mask based on this thing, which was fourfold symmetry, and you had to say mm, that's not all four. Uh, so how big was your focus mask, and where where was the limits of the focus mask? Uh, around the density map on the right-hand side? And how would that compare with how you chose it on the left? Uh, that's a really good question. And actually, um, so you're right that when you're, when you're making these masks, you're using your intuition a little bit. Oh, and I used to have, that's okay. If you'll excuse me digging through my file system for a moment. Um, yeah, schematically, that's what you had to do, but. Yeah, yeah, let me just pull, I took that slide out, of course. Uh, no, it's this thing. So, I think it's this. Um, so to answer the question while I fiddle around here, um, the mask is very large and it actually covers, um, yeah, I don't have it, sorry. Um, but here I have just an image of it. So uh, this is a slice. So we're looking at the whole channel, but just a slice through the masks. The focus mask is the kind of solid slice. So you can see it's, it's actually quite big. It also includes a large part of the TMD, right? So the linker, the, the knots are here. And so the linker is just right here. So the mask includes a very large part of the TMD and it is a, a ring. So it includes all four of the linkers. So I, cause I didn't want to bias. I don't want to, I don't ever want to say I'm looking for this, right? I kind of want to let the data show me if it's there. So my mask is, is basically just this huge kind of, I don't know, ice cream scoop thing on top of the TMD. And then it just so happened that during that initial PCA, there happened to be noise here. And so we got a class that had just the two. So the mask itself is, is perfectly symmetric. Yeah. Well, not perfectly, but you know, it's symmetric. Okay. And I think unless there's any more questions, we can do a quick break and then uh, it'll be Michael's awesome uh, uh, section. Thanks for your attention, everyone.